Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the City of London Investment Trust Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions today and will publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and I'm sure that the company would be most grateful for your participation. And I'd now like to hand over to Portfolio Manager from Janice Henderson, managing the City of London Investment Trust, Job Curtis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mark. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And I'll run through talk about City of London's objective, some of the background, how we've been performing over recently and the longer term, and how I'm seeing the market, how the portfolio is positioned. So to start with a bit of background, um, as you may well know, our objective is to achieve long-term growth in capital and income, principally through UK equities or equities listed on London Stock Exchange. And we've got a very firm commitment to dividend income uh, one of the key features of investment trusts, which I always mention in presentations, is the independent board of directors. They're, they're one of our big advantages. City of London has five um, independent directors, uh, of which uh, three are male, two are female. And our chairman is Sir Laurie Magnus, who's got a long career as a corporate financier. He's still an advisor for Evercore, which is an investment bank. But he also, in December, was appointed as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's ethics advisor. Um, and he was immediately busy with that business. The Conservative Party chairman who was in dispute with HMRC in, 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 ja in January uh, and had to deal with that. Um, City London is the biggest trust in the UK equity income investment trust sector. We have just under £2 billion worth of assets. And we've been very popular over the years. Over the last 10 years, we've increased our share capital by 93% through issuing shares at a premium to net asset value, around 2% premium. And by issuing them at that level, we do enhance the net asset value for existing shareholders. But when we went to a small discount back in September 20, which was just ahead of the um, announcement of the vaccines, we actually bought in at a 2% discount. So we were buying it at a level kind of mirroring the level we've been issuing at. And that's, that's very much our intention going forward if we did go back to a discount. <coughs> um, I've been portfolio manager since um, 1991, so it's 32 years. It's been a, been a huge privilege to have managed this great investment trust over that long period. Um, I've worked with David Smith in Janet Henderson's Global Equity Income team for over 10 years, and he was appointed deputy portfolio manager just over two years ago. Um, our trust has a very low management fee, only 0.325% in net assets, and that's a tribute to the independent board of directors who negotiated with Janice Henderson. And that's a big advantage for our shareholders. And it means our ongoing charge ratio, which includes the other um, admin expenses, is 0.37%, which is the lowest in our sector and very low for an actively managed fund. A further feature I'd, I'd like to mention is um, that we have some long-term debt. This is another advantage investment trusts can, can do, which can't, you can't do with open-ended funds. And during the period of ultra low interest rates, we issued some very cheap debt. So we've um, got um, some secured notes going out to 2046, which we're paying only, paying only 2.67% per annum. And a further um, 50 million pounds worth of notes going out to 2049, which we're paying 2.94% per annum. So you know, those um, add value to shareholders so long as we can beat those very low coupons. And if we can't beat those, it, it'll be a sad old world over, over that period. So we've secured very cheap um, debt finance for our shareholders for the next quarter of a century. Um, I work in the Janice Henderson Global Equity Income team. Uh, we manage about £13 billion altogether. I'm actually, um, the only other thing I do uh, is I'm a co-manager of a Global Equity Income Fund for American investors. And that brings in, you know, with, with colleagues, and that brings in some very good global ideas um, and also helps me judge our UK companies against um, global peers. I'm actually the oldest member of the team. I'm, I'm 62. Uh, but James Henderson in the second row is, is only two weeks younger than me. So I'm in good company. And um, you know, James and I have had the benefit of going around the track a few times with our obviously long experience. But we've got some very bright colleagues mid-career and earlier in their careers who bring a different perspective and obviously closer and in touch with some of the trends in, in society that, that, that we now have. 
Uh, so I'll now talk a bit about um, my investment philosophy before we go on to sort of um, performance. Um, so my, my basic belief is that um, share price valuation is critical. That is what ultimately determines the long-term return. So it is a valuation-driven approach. Um, I do take notice of the macro factors as well. I don't kind of sit in an ivory tower. And I, I start with dividend yield, uh, but I'm really looking for companies that can pay a decent dividend but grow their dividends. And that means they have to invest enough for future growth. So I'm not interested in pay, being in high yield, so-called value traps where they're not investing enough for the future and they probably end up cutting their dividends. The other side to my approach is I'm, I'm very conservative. I'm um, conservative character and the fund is run in a conservative way. I like companies with good cash generation. They're best able to support dividends and invest enough for the future. I also like companies with strong, strong balance sheets, especially for cyclical companies. Those are companies in you know, industries that go up and down with the economic cycle. I mean, in, 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 when things are you know, in a recession or, or turning down, it's companies with high debts who have the most, worst problems and they're often unable to carry on paying their dividends. So I try and avoid that type of situation. And overall, in my approach, I'm looking as much for the, um, I'm looking both at the upside potential as well as the downside risks. Um, so it is a conservative approach altogether. So when I look at um, performance, um, the chart above shows you the performance um, going back over the 32 years since I became City of London's fund manager. And the top chart shows you City's NAV total return. And the, the bottom line shows you the FTSE Orsha index, the main measure of the UK market. And you can see we're comfortably ahead of the index over the 32 years. The best performance you know, has been achieved during bear markets. My, my approach tends to be that you know, I make good gains in rising markets, um, but the best performance, relative performance comes in for, in kind of more difficult markets where, I'm t where historically I've been good at in relatively preserving people's capital relative to, to competition. Um, looking at the kind of more recent performance, um, over the last year, we returned 4.5%, which was behind the FTSE Orsha index. So we definitely don't perform every year or outperform every year. The FTSE Orsha was 7.9% over the 12 months, but we were ahead of the FTSE All Show. We are still ahead of FTSE All Show over three, five, and 10 years against our UK equity income investment trust sector. We're behind over one and 10 years, but ahead over three and five years. But against the UK equity income OIC sector, we're ahead over one, three, five, and 10 years. So I'll now look at the um, one year performance in a bit more detail. So the top table spits out the um, kind of relative performance in terms of the various sort of components. And over the 12 months to the end of June, which is our financial year, uh, stock selection was actually negative in this period by 4.3 percentage points in contrast with the previous 12 months when it had been positive by, by four point, almost 4.7 percentage points. Gearing was positive by 1.13. And that is a, because uh, it's a sort of technical consideration really, but because we issued that very cheap debt, the fair value of that debt had actually declined. And that was an enhancement to our net asset value. Um, expenses were low at 0.37, um, as we talked about earlier with the low management fee. And all those share issues, which I mentioned earlier, they contributed because they were at a premium to NAV by 0.18. So altogether, we, we underperformed by 3.38 percentage points. Uh, looking at the main sector contributors and detractors, um, it was more a case of not being in certain areas. Um, the biggest single detractor was travel and leisure, which is a sector City of London has been quite light and obviously it had a difficult time during the pandemic in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic. It had a strong recovery over the 12 months. And in addition, we're being our conservative type of trust when we went in some of the large gaming stocks, in particular Flutter Entertainment, which is um, doesn't pay a dividend, was a stock detractor for us. Um, the second biggest attractive sector was banks where we were underweight. Uh, in particular, we, although we've got a large holding in HSBC, we are underweight relative to the index and also don't hold standard chartered. The third biggest attracting sector was house builders, um, particular, not, uh, particular owning persimmon. And we also had a small holding of Taylor Wimpy and they've been very good stocks in the long run and good dividend pairs, but they uh, certainly um, gave ground with the weakness in the housing market over the 12 months. And then in construction materials, we didn't hold a building material stock, stock called CRH, which is relifting to the US and did, did particularly well. And that cost us. And in industrial transportation, we didn't hold a stock 
livestock called Ashted. So that deals with the tractors in the um, contributors, actually the biggest contributors, not owning other investment trusts, other closed ended funds that contributed by 0.49. Investment banking and brokerage services is better described as financial services. And our best performer was actually 3i group, which could be classified as closed ended, but isn't. And it owns some um, stakes in private firms and in particular owns a big stake in a discount retailer in Europe called Action, which is doing phenomenally well. Pharmaceuticals, we were underweight and that contributed. Electricity, we were overweight, holding SSE, which is Britain's biggest renewable energy company through hydro and wind generation. And that contributed by 16 basis points. And then general industrials, the main contributor was Siemens, the big German industrial stock. So looking more at the uh, companies themselves, um, the biggest single detractor over the 12 months was direct line insurance, where they had a big profit warning last January. Basically, premium income had not been keeping pace with claims inflation. And um, as a result, they had to stop paying their dividend. We reduced the holding uh, substantially. Um, but we do think that we've held on to some because we think there will be a recovery. As you probably, as you sure you know, insurance, motor insurance reprices every year when you get your premium letter. And premiums have been going up very rapidly. So we think they will recover back into profitability. I've already talked about persimmon, flutter and CRH, but Verizon is a US telecom stock, which has been a good dividend pair of the years, but gave back ground over the 12 months, but we didn't hold BT and we've got only a small holding in Vodafone. So that was helpful, not, not having much exposure to the UK ones. Biggest contributors I mentioned through our group already, Munich Ray is a German reinsurance stock. So we benefited, although we lost out in direct line, we benefited from uh, rising reinsurance rates. And that was a good contributor. Wholesome as a Swiss-based global building material stock. I mentioned Siemens and Ferguson is a US, um, it's a stock that's relisted to the US, what's UK listed, and it's a large building building um, builders merchant over there. So to talk about the um the kind of main action over the 12 months, um, I think one of the themes was really uh, we're allowed to hold up to 20% in overseas listed stocks. And I actually took some very big profits in two of them for reinvestment in the UK, in particular Microsoft, we bought in 2011, um, when it was on a mid-teens price earnings ratio, dividend yield of 3%. And it's been a tremendous performer over the years, driven by its leadership in cloud computing. And this year, it's had another leg upwards uh, with its um, position in AI or artificial intelligence. And by the time I sold the final amount in June, it was on a P of 32 times and dividend yield of only 0.7%. And actually its market capitalization was worth almost the whole of the FTSE 100 index combined. So I decided at that point um, that it was better relative value elsewhere. And so I've sold the final part of the holding and reinvested in some UK listed mid cap uh, or, or sort of smaller FTSE 100 stocks in particular DS Smith, which is paper and packaging. It's number two across Europe, um, very innovative also big in recycling. Morgan and Vance and Vesuvius are kind of industrial stocks, leaders in niche areas. And all these three stocks are modestly rated, in my opinion, uh, with uh, well, well undervaluing the quality of their businesses and the scope for re-rating potential. Also overseas, I sold out of BHP, the mining group, which we've held for a long time, very good profit. Um, it's relisted. It used to be 50% listed in UK. It's now gone to 100% in Australia. Um, and it's re-rated against the UK listed miners. So actually, we, we reinvested in Glencore, which is UK listed. And Glencore is actually better positioned in some of the minerals of the future, metals of the future, such as 37% of its profits come from copper. It's also got a world-leading trading business, which accounts for 20% of profits, whilst BHP is very dependent on iron ore and Chinese still demand for iron ore where the outlook's uncertain. Um, also, we bought a new holding in NatWest last summer um, and it was guiding to 14 to 16% uh, return on tangible on, on equity and it was standing at a discount for its book value. It looked very cheap. It's delivered very good dividends over the, um, since we bought it, obviously we've had the issues uh, surrounding Nigel Farage and the chief executive going, but it has been a very good dividend stock and I think there's still a lot of upside there. Um, and then finally, I did buy some Round Hill royalties. This is um, a fund that owns music royalties. And I bought them in June on a 40% discount to their asset value. Um, I, I'm a kind of quite a late convert to streaming, but I, I enjoy my Spotify on the train. And um, 
And I think it's they're very valuable, some of these royalties. I mean, and they've got a particularly strong portfolio of music um, made, uh, made before 2000, year 2000, kind of a so called evergreen portfolio. And they've actually received a bid at a 65% premium. So that's been a very successful short term investment. Um, and look at the other sales. Bruin Dolphin was private account wealth group was taken over by Royal Bank of Canada. Croda is a stock we own for over two decades, chemical stock. It's totally re-rated for a high dividend yield to low dividend yield. It's focused on making sort of clever ingredients and cosmetics from natural oils. But it did have a profits warning earlier this year, and I felt the share price rating was too high given the profit warning, and there could be another profit warning to follow possibly. And Synthoma was another chemical stock which actually did very badly and had to stop paying its dividend and felt it was best to exit that one. So that gives you a kind of overview of some of the main action over the last 12 months. In terms of the revenue, obviously, we're very proud of our dividend record. Um, you know, we've got the longest record of any investment trust, in fact, of any UK listed company I know of, 57 consecutive years for increases. But the key point to make here is that we could only have achieved it through the investment trust structure. We have got a core of consistent companies, but it's the investment trust structure that allows us to hold back some income in the good years. And um, and then pay pay from it in the difficult years. So if you look at this table, um, you can see that in the year to 30th of June 19, we actually earned 19.76 and paid out 18.6. So we actually paid out 94%, but put almost 6% into the reserve. And, and luckily we had those reserves because the following year to 30th of June 2020 was the year of the pandemic um, and all those dividends, cuts, suspensions, et cetera. And, um, FTSE 100 dividends went down by 36%. It was worse outside the FTSE. And so we had to dig in. We still grew our dividend from 18.6 to 19, but we actually paid out 21% from reserves in that year. The following year, I paid out 11.8% from reserves. But then last year, we were able to put money back into reserves. This year, we were kind of fully covered, almost fraction went into reserves. Um, we grew our dividend by 2.6%. That's below inflation, difficult to beat inflation given where inflation was, but over 10 years, our dividend's gone up by slightly over 40%, which compares with 33% for cumulative inflation. It's definitely the board's intention to um, beat inflation over the whole economic cycle. Um, so this next chart just shows you the dividend growth going right back to 1966. And it just shows you, you know, if you hold for the long run, how the dividend compounds up in size. And I think the other uh, slot, pie chart on the right is quite interesting. It just shows you our spread of, of um, income. You know, as I said, we're a conservative fund and the whole principle is not to have all your eggs in one basket. And you can see our biggest single sector is consumer staples, but we were not really overly exposed to any one area of the market. And it's got a good spread of income into different sectors. So we're not going to be um, tripped up by any difficulties in any one particular area of the market. So I now look at the um, portfolio and, and the market outlook. Uh, so I'm going to talk first a bit about the stock market itself. Um, this chart just shows you the underperformance of the UK market over the last 10 years. So the top line um, shows you the world index excluding the UK and the bottom line is the, it's the FTSE all share of the UK market. And I think the biggest single reason for the underperformance is the, the huge role the big tech stocks in America have played in the world index. And these are giant companies now and they've been performing very well, justifiably. And we don't have the equivalent in the UK. But even if you look at the UK on a like-for-like -like basis, um, UK shares are very cheap. You compare the valuation of, say, Shell with Exxon, the oil major in America, or you compare, um, say, British American Tobacco Imperial Brands with Philip Morris or Altria. You know, it's a chasm in terms of valuation. You know, why is, why is this the case? Well, I think it's the lack of domestic support for our equities. Our institutions are predominantly um, invested in fixed interest these days. Where they have equities, they've gone very global, and the UK is only 4% of the global market. But I think the great thing about the UK is we've got a very open system for corporate control. Um, you do get takeover bids where you get cheap valuations. And from our portfolio, we've had bids last couple of years for William Morris and Supermarkets, Bruin Dolphin, Daily Mail in general, and, and now Roundhill. So, um, and I think more, more takeover bids will continue from both um, private companies uh, private equity and also overseas companies. So given the superior dividend yield you can find in the UK market, you're really 
paid while you wait, while you wait, or paid to hold on in UK equities at the moment. So the next um, slide just shows you a couple of basic valuation measures of, of UK equities. The top chart shows you um, the price earnings ratio of the market uh, over the last 20 years, and we're below the 20 year average, which means the market's cheap relative to 20 year average. And the bottom chart compares the dividend yield of equities with base rates and 10 and 30 year gilts. And on that basis, it's, there's been a change. For our, you know, we've moved from these ultra low interest rates. And so we've now got a situation where equities are yielding slightly less than base rates and fixed interest. And But I think this is justified for most of my career um, and for, indeed from the 1950s until the financial crisis, equities did yield less than fixed interest. And the reason is you get dividend growth from equities and a potential for capital growth. So I'm not particularly phased by, by that, the, that change, which is actually only reverting back to what had been the case longer term. In terms of where I am on economics, I mean, inflation's making a welcome fall, having peaked at 11%. Was down to 6.7% last month. Um, but I feel it's going to stay sticky well above the government's 2% target, given the moment private sector wage growth is at 8%. So I expect we might have reached a peak on interest base rates, but I think interest rates will remain elevated. And some of the implications will take time to show their effect. I mean, almost all mortgages are on a two-year fix now, so it takes a while for people to roll over into new mortgage rates and also for companies to, to refinance. In addition, there's a so-called quantitative tightening happening with um, the central banks instead of hoovering up in bonds in, in global markets. Um, Bank of England's now, now selling off £10 billion pounds worth a month and the Fed's doing similar as equivalent moves in the US. So overall, our gearing is quite cautious at the moment. It's down to only 6% and we've got a lot of, um, um, we've got a lot of bank facilities available to us to invest in the market when, when we get more confident. So this um, next um, slide just gives you an overall pitch of the portfolio. We've, we have 87 holdings. It helps us to have a relatively long list of holdings, partly because we're conservative and don't want to be overly exposed to any one company, but also for given the size of our fund, for getting exposure to medium-sized companies. There are liquidity issues if, if, you, if we were too concentrated. We're 75% in the FTSE 100, 10% in the rest of the UK market, and 15% in some sort of high-quality overseas listed companies we can add uh, in areas like pharmaceuticals or telecoms over what we can get in the UK. Our biggest single grouping is financials with HSBC, the biggest holding, but actually we're more overweight in insurance and financial services than we are in banks. Uh, but actually we think the current environment of, of higher interest rates is good for many financials, both banks, it's easier for them to price deposits and earn their net interest margin. Also for insurance companies, it is a positive. So so we think it's not a bad environment for financials at the moment. Consumer staples is the second biggest grouping at 19%. I mean, they've been a big mainstay of the portfolio for many years. These are great core for income funds. These are global companies. They're used to inflation in many of the markets. They operate in Unilever's big and emerging markets like India, for example. Um, and we, so these are very consistent dividend growers and good companies as a core. Industrials are third biggest weighting, BA Systems, is doing well at the moment. Um, it's been a very good stock in recent years for us. Um, it's, it's a bit, there's a sea change has happened. We've moved on from the post-Cold War peace dividend to a period where countries are having to rearm and BA is particularly well placed. Its biggest market is the US followed by the UK, but it's got great prospects in countries like Australia, Japan, and in Eastern Europe. We've got just under 9% in oil, with Shell our biggest holding. And then in healthcare, we've got to also just under 9% with AstraZeneca, our biggest holding. We've actually got exposure to Merck of the US and Novartis of Switzerland and Johnson Johnson. And these companies have actually got better dividend records. And AstraZeneca has been good, but these got better dividend records um, than AstraZeneca and, and better dividend yields. Um, though AstraZeneca has been very successful in, with um, their uh, development of new drugs. And it's been a good share price performance. So this next slide is interesting. It's a pie chart, um, and it dr drills down at the underlying sales of um, the companies in our portfolio, our, our investee companies. And what's so interesting is you can see that 69% of the underlying sales or revenue from our companies comes from outside the UK. So around 31% in the UK. We've got decent UK exposure, but uh, over two-thirds of the revenue is from overseas. So 
and it's quite a good spread of overseas, 24% North America, but you know, 11% emerging markets Asia, uh, 12% emerging other emerging markets, countries like companies like Unilever and BA Tobacco have got big emerging markets exposure. So um, it just shows you that you're really buying um, global growth, but at a UK stock market discounted rating. <coughs> Uh, so this looks at the uh, top 10 holdings in the portfolio. So there are four consumer staple stocks in the top 10. Unilever, BA Tobacco, Diageo, our big alcoholic beverage company, owner of um, Johnny Walker Scotch Whiskey and Guinness, and then Imperial Brands. Two oil companies, Shell and BP. And then I've already talked about BAE, HSBC. Relics is an information business information provider. You could really call it a technology company. It's very well placed to benefit from artificial intelligence have been a great compounder in the portfolio and it's a good example of a lower yielding stock in our portfolio. Uh, looking at the next 10 down, 3i group, where I talked about the strong performance there from the owner of private um, companies or stakes and private companies, almost in the top 10. Tesco's, which had good results this week, by far our biggest retailer, were quite low. One area underweight, area underweight is in consumer discretion and Tesco's is more a staple being a supermarket group, but it's um, it's doing well at the moment. Rio Tinto is our biggest miner, followed by Glencore and Anglo American. And then we've got this um, big exposure to kind of life assurance and financial services and very attractive yields from the likes of Phoenix, MG, Legal and Jane, General and St. James's Place. And our two biggest utilities are National Grid and SSE. And these both these companies are well placed to benefit from the electrification of the economy over the long term. And then finally, at number 20 is Lloyds Bank, which is our biggest UK domestic bank. We've also got some NatWest and Barclays. And, um, and so that takes the top 10. So the, the, the top 20, the top 50 rather, is a slightly over 50% of the portfolio. So we've got, we're not overly concentrated in any one stock. I mean, I mean certainly there's all stock specific risk up there. I can remember in 2010 when BP almost went bankrupt at the time of the Macando oil spill. So, um, so we always, conscious of the fact that um, we need to spread the risk. So to conclude, before I turn it back to Mark for questions, um, uh, to start the questions, um, it's 57 years of um, annual dividend increases, the longest record of any investment trust or to my knowledge, any UK company. There are some US companies with longer records like Johnson Johnson, which we hold. Um, but as I said, it, we, it's a core of consistent companies in the portfolio, but it's the investment trust structure that's also being critical, having those revenue reserves to help grow the dividend in the difficult years for dividends across the market. We have the lowest charges in our sector at any point three seven percent which is very low for an actively managed fund. And we have outperformed in the long run. Don't outperform every year. We are underperformed last year, but we have outperformed significantly in the long run through a conservative investment style. So thank you very much for listening. And um now I'll pass back to Mark to start introducing that's, some questions. That's great, Job. Thank you very much indeed for updating investors this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions. Just using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen, which is why Job takes a few moments to review your questions submitted already. I'd just like to remind you that recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investment Company dashboard. Um, Joe, you've received a, a number of questions from investors. So firstly, thank you to everybody for your engagement uh, this afternoon. Uh, if I may, Joe, just hand back to you to read out those questions, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question is, um, thank you for your presentation. What succession planning is there for the management of the trust? None of us are getting younger. Well, I can certainly <laughs> agree with the, none of us getting younger. Um, but I still feel very enthusiastic and um, and I find the stock market fascinating. Um, so I haven't set my, my retirement date, but um, I do work very close with David Smith and he is the deputy manager. If something was to happen to me health-wise, um, you know, he is there to, to sort of take over uh, immediately um, in that type of situation. But ultimately, the appointment of a new manager, it's a decision for both um, Janice Henderson and also the board of City of London Investment Trust would have to agree on, on my successor. But certainly I work closely with David and you saw that slide earlier of, of my colleagues in the global equity. We were kind of embedded within the global equity team at Janice Henderson. So it's not, that's great. Thank you. And um, it's not just about um, me at all. Um, I sort of headed up, but um, I work with great colleagues and um, in particular, David is the kind of, you know, is the key person in terms of succession planning. Uh, so the second question is, um, 
lots of talk about the attractiveness of the UK compared to overseas arm listing in the UK, US, for example. What's your view and how does this impact your investment decisions? Well, obviously, the reason why arm invested in uh, listed in the US is that basically you get a more get a higher uh, valuation in the US. Um, partly because the US market is more highly rated, but also the US, to be fair, has had a much deeper pool of um, of money for technology stocks. I mean, they have a huge technology sector. I mean, it's been something that's phenomenal. You know, you've got to admire the whole, uh, you know, inventiveness and entrepreneurship of the US. It's, I mean, when you look at the companies leading the whole new era, digital era, and artificial intelligence, invariably, usually American. And, um, and, and so they got a much better rating over there. Um, so, but, and I'm usually quite wary of um, when technology stocks list in the UK, you usually sort of a bit wondering why, you know, a bit. And, um, you know, sometimes it, it does lead you to be a bit cautious. But um, uh, but I think overall, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously trying to deliver both income and capital gains. And um, I think the fact that you've got these very attractive dividend yields in the UK and the fact the market is cheap is, is, I think, quite encouraging. I think it's good for uh, our investors. It means that we're kind of, as I said earlier, we've, we're being paid with a decent dividend yield um, and we've got potential uh, our upside. And, I, and to be honest, the US has led you know, over the last decade for sure. Um, but I can remember earlier in my career, the Japanese stock market was on fire. And that at one point was the biggest stock market in the world. The Japanese stock was actually bigger than the US stock market. So these things don't continue forever. And um, you do get um, cycles. And um, so I think it's quite a good moment to be in the UK when it's kind of quite out of favor and yet good value and um, and paying a decent dividend yield. So the next um, question is, what sectors do you think will perform the best over the next 12 months? Um, I mean, that's quite a difficult question. I mean, obviously, I've, you know, structured a portfolio. I kind of put my money where my mouth is. And um, and so, you know, I like these financial services. I think there's tremendous value in, in financial services. I mentioned um, earlier, I mentioned, um, you know, stocks in there like Phoenix Group and m and I mean, these are both yielding 9%. They, they're growing their dividends. And we've met with the company management, both companies, in the last um, week or so. And, um, you know, I, I'm convinced that they they're generating enough cash to, you know, easily cover these dividends and and growth, best enough for future growth. So, you know, I find it puzzling in a way these stocks are so so cheap. I mean, it may be partly because they're quite opaque, uh, but they're, and life life assurance is generally a slightly out of favor sector globally. And there've been some recently some accounting changes, which kind of muddy the walk, waters further. But, um, but I think there's tremendous value in, in those areas. I mean, some of the, it's certainly true with the mid, the kind of medium-sized smaller companies are sold off quite heavily, particularly domestic cyclicals. And at some point, there will be recovery potential. I mean, you know, when investors get more confident that we're kind of, you know, nearer the end of the interest rate right cycle and um, begin to look anticipate interest rate cuts, and you know, you can get some sort of big moves in some of the domestic sectors. You know, like house builders and building materials. We own like got smallish holdings in Ipswich. The UK is leading Brickmaker and Marshalls, which are leading Maker and Paving Stones, and also in some Mali roof tarbers, which that's leader lead in roofing. Uh, and those businesses will do very well when house building picks up. And I do think that, you know, we in the UK are short of new houses. I mean, we've got, we've had population growth through immigration, and there's a whole generation out there who are renting who, who want to own as well. So I think there's a lot of latent demand for housing out there. And, um, I think this sector will be good. It's difficult at the moment, and I'm sort of hanging on in there. It's not, it's not as, as we saw when we reviewed performance. The, you know, house builders have detracted over the second biggest detracting sector of the last 12 months. But it, um, but I think um, ultimately that sector will recover quite well. But it's quite difficult to sort of, um, you know, pin, be absolutely sure when that recovery really, really begins to take place. But it's, um, but I think that's an interest one, another interesting area. <clears throat> So the next um, question is, um, what role does ESG play in your stock selection? So ESG stands for Environmental, Social and, and Governance. Um, and so you know, it is very important to understand both the risks and, and opportunities from, from ESG. Um, uh, so, um, and we factor that into our valuation process for sure. Um, but we don't. What we don't do is exclude any sectors. Um, you know, we we think it's more a question of understanding 
where, where there is some opportunities. And we actually do a measure in, in our annual report, which has just been published of, of cities. Um, portfolio reality index in terms of ESG risks, which is done by MSCI. And we are actually slightly below average ISO, better we're on the right side for, for ESG, only slightly, but compared with the market index. And we've also got we got less um, exposure to carbon emissions than, than the index as well. Not massively, but but we're on the right side of both those things. But essentially, um, you know, I do think that sometimes it throws up opportunities in particular. Um, you know, I mentioned BA systems and, you know, surprisingly and sadly, you know, a lot of the these so-called responsible funds didn't um weren't felt they couldn't invest in BA systems because it was an armaments company. But you know, the reality is if we don't have companies, you know, making sophisticated armaments, you know, we're gonna be at the mercy of tyrants like Putin. So, you know, I, I think that a company like BA is is, you know it's you know producing is socially good products you know i think undoubtedly and um and i think there has been a change in thinking since the russian invasion of ukraine by some of those funds about how they would classify defense spend defense is literally as it is described defense so um you know obviously tobacco is a highly controversial s- sector um but we think the um you know we think that the risk i mean certainly ba tobacco in particular is is pivoting very strongly to less harmful products um, than, than cigarettes. And but the valuations of both BAT and Imperial Brands is extraordinarily low. I mean, Imperial Brands had a trading update today, and they are on a dividend yield of almost nine percent, a price earnings ratio of about five point eight times, and they announced an increase of their share buyback to one point one billion pounds over the next twelve months. So they'll probably be returning around seventeen percent of their market capitalization for a mixture of share buybacks and dividends over the next 12 months so it is you know it is extraordinarily cheap and i think the risks risks are, are well in the valuation i mean the oil companies are another controversial area where we, although we've got decent exposure to oil we are slightly underweight compared to the all share index and but we still think it's you know we just don't think that um the whole of society can pivot to you know can drop oil immediately i think um you know oil will continue to play a role for quite a few years. In particular, natural gas has a big role as, as, a, um, as a transition energy and that it's, um, uh, it's not intermittent like renewables. You know, on a cold, dark night, you can still power electricity from, from, and have gas from the North Sea, et cetera. Um, and it, it emits a lot less carbon than, say, oil or coal does. So, so we think it's got a, a role as the transition, though we are undoubtedly moving to, to a... Um, to, to a much lower carbon future and much bigger role for electricity in the in in the energy sector and and we have got I think I mentioned as I mentioned in the top 20 we've got two companies which are incredibly well placed um, for electricity generation I mean, in particular SSE is uh, the Britain's biggest renewable energy company it has a mixture of hydroelectric plants up in Scotland and also it's our biggest um, wind farm operator in in the North Sea and so it's it's got a huge role going forward. It also owns electricity networks, as does National Grid, both both sides of the Atlantic. So um, National Grid's business is is almost half in the US, in the Northeast. So so we we think um you know they, that would be an example of a set of companies where we we see an opportunity for for growth through through the um uh, through through the um ESG factors. Uh, so then uh, next question is um. Does the depressed valuations of listed companies in the UK restrict the pool of companies you can invest in? Is there a valuation threshold beneath which you can't invest? Um, so um, I think the sort of depressed valuations is, you know, is kind of an opportunity um, for me, really. Um, so I, I, I see that as an opportunity. I mean, I think the UK market, I mean, what we don't have is a big technology sector, but I haven't been afraid to investing technology shares and um i mentioned you know we did help we bought microsoft and they're very cheap back in 2011 and you know they have done extra, extraordinarily well but you know it's you know we're not afraid to being out of things if, if they if they get expensive i mean we do dabble in some very cheap overseas value stocks there's one in hong kong called swa pacific which is kind of controlled by the swa family who are british and it's um standing at a discount to it's shelled against swa properties which is a Hong Kong is a subsidiary and and Cafe Pacific where the airline where it holds a 45% stake and also owns um a um 
big a, a big Coca-Cola bottling business across the Pacific. So uh, that that's a very cheap value share, in in my opinion. Is there a valuation threshold beneath which you can't invest? Well, I tend not. I won't buy zero dividend yielders. I think that's for a different type of fund. Um, and you know, I have to say, stocks yielding below two percent, you know, I'd be unlikely to start an investment at that at that level. Um, so, you know, I think two percent and above is fine. And we've got plenty of two percent, you know, yield companies yielding between two and three percent in in the portfolio who may be having more rapid dividend growth than, than the higher yielding ones. I mean, we won't. We will kind of hold on to stocks sometimes when they stop paying a dividend. I mean, direct line stop paying a dividend. I did reduce it, but um, I've kept a kind of smaller holding because I think there is very strong recovery potential. So, you know, you don't want to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. But um, but I think um, certainly, you know, as a starting place, I think the, you know, kind of zero yielding stocks, we're not the right fund for that. You, you know, there are plenty of funds out there you can invest in you know, who, who, but obviously we, we our shareholders want a mixture of, of um, income and capital returns. And so, you know, I really draw the line when it comes to, to zero, zero yielding shock stocks. So I think that's um, all the questions that we've yep. we've had. So you have, I'll, Joe. I'll pass you, back to Mark. You've taken all the questions. So firstly, thank you once again to everybody for engagement. And uh, Job, thank you uh, for your responses. Uh, Job, I know investor feedback will be particularly important to, to you, and I'll shortly redirect those on the call uh, to give you their thoughts and expectations. But I wonder before doing so, if I may just come back to you for a few closing comments. Uh, thank you again, Mark. Thank you for the opportunity to um, to present on Investor Meet, and thank you for everyone for listening. And I just leave you with the overall message. You know, we, we've got this, we're incredibly proud of our dividend track record, 57 years of annual dividend increases. Uh, you know, we, we're very good value in terms of our charges and, you know, we've outperformed the long term, but it's through a conservative investment style. Thank you again for listening. That's great. Job, thank you once again for updating investors. Ladies and gentlemen, please could ask you not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the team can better understand your views and expectations. This may take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of City of London Investment Trust PLC, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all. Thank you.